My hope is that everybody leaves uplifted and with a greater understanding of healing through poetry, of the power of love and um, the power of fellowship and uh, spirituality. I'm going to start with two poems, soft poems, soft poems, to get into the rhythm of poetry. Fun Land and Park. My father and I walked beneath the sign, I don't recall a special occasion, or other siblings coming along. Just the two of us in part of Miami slightly run down, which magnified the thrill. He said, go on any ride you want. Kids screams and magnetized me to the motor cars. I climbed into one and stepped on the pedal. Easy to accelerate and fun to steer. Rounded the periphery to build up speed and gave a ponytailed girl a thunk. Boys and I bumped each other. My father smiled, so this was okay, preparing me for the ride to come. She bumped me, I bumped back, more softly this time. The electricity shut off. The ride was over. She and I sat in our motionless cars that exchanged a look when we saw new sparks crackle from stems connected to the electrified ceiling. My father stood there, strong and knowledgeable, in his Amlon shirt. <laughs> rifle. My father purchased the rifle at the start of the trip to Bascalore Village with Greg Jr. and me. We drove clear across Florida on the Tamiami Trail through Seminole Country and saw young boys with bows and arrows and no interest in us as we passed in the car. Sitting in the boat in the middle of the lake, we caught nothing but water bugs skittering in circles and laughed when Dad called it No Pass Ballora Village, where I shot tin cans of a 22. My father stopped the car, turning homeward, and inexplicably threw the gun in the river. That rifle, I have so often recalled, has been here in my hands all along, loaded. My father met Jack Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, in Washington in the 1940s. Dad was administrative assistant to George Smathers, whose congressional campaign he had just successfully run, and George brought him up to Washington, where down the hall, two doors down, was John F. Kennedy. They became great friends, and um, when he met Jack Kennedy, he came back that day and said to my mother, this man's going to be president one day. Their friendship grew uh, after Dad returned to Miami, where he was a Dade County Commissioner and a state legislator, where I'm proud to say he was uh, the first person in the South to pass an anti-KKK bill, introducing past that. Um, he got to know Jack better when Jack was recuperating from back surgery in Palm Beach, and Dad went off often up to Palm Beach to, to, to meet with him. And it was there that um, Jack finished Profiles of Courage, the book he wrote, and which Dad, I think, may have had a hand in, in helping to title. My father campaigned for Jack uh, for the presidential campaign, after which um, the president appointed my father ambassador to Ireland. The following poem takes place just one week after Jack was elected, and, uh, and he came to stay with us in Coral Gables. It's called Limousines, which is the name of the first of three sections in Gorilla. Limousines. Kennedy is elected president. There's so much happiness in the house. And now he's coming to spend the night. His limousine and the line of black cars walk the street beneath palm trees and a clear November sky. Men in dark suits wander the yard as Mr. Kennedy and my father talk on the street porch. I sit on the floor and peel an orange. I want to make him feel at home. My mother asks what he'd like to drink. A Coke, he says. We have no Cokes. My big sister drives to the A and P and brings home a case. He wanted just one. Anyway, now he's taking a nap. But I have to be quiet and can't play outside. They're all dressed up, going out for dinner. 
my mother in the brown chiffon dress dad loves. I'll be in bed by the time they get back, see my opening, step up and ask, what can I do to be president? Learn your history, he says, and mind your mother. My mother smiles before the president's brains are splattered into the back of the limousine. One week later, my father commits suicide. Anyone. The oversized photograph and movie reel live in our home in a rusted filing cabinet. The photograph looks down on a body on the roof of Miami's DuPont building. A thick white broken line traces the path from a window on the 13th floor. An arrow, the kind you peel off and stick on, is next to and points at the body, face down, arms at its side, white dress shirt untucked at the back. Five men stand around the body, some smoke. The movie, from a safe vantage point, lasts three minutes. A white stretcher pushed across from the right. A priest climbs out a window, kneels on one knee. <clears throat> Smell of new lumber. Lee Harvey Oswald murders JFK. My name, also Lee, does not help me not think I am in some way responsible for my father's death. Should have been at the window. No, Dad, stop. Wind in gray air wings, flapping to get back to the ledge. Was he thinking on the way down this was a monumental mistake. About the smell of new lumber. Our unfinished treehouse going into that lumber yard, picking out boards, driving them home, sticking out the car window. Was he thinking, he'll finish it by himself? How hard can it be to hammer nails through wood? <clears throat> Gets better from here. I would be remiss if I didn't um, say, give you a poem about living in Ireland, which was an almost surreal experience <clears throat> akin to living, I think, in a Downton Abbey kind of life. Our house guests included Ethel Kennedy, Grace Kelly, Peter Ustinoff, Jack Parr, his daughter Randy, Teddy Kennedy, Bob Hope. The house seemed to always be teeming with sparkling personalities. All you have to know for this poem is that Bill was the ambassador's chauffeur and The Untouchables was an American TV show about Elliot Ness and the FBI, a show that did not play on Irish television. It's called Burning Flesh for Bing Crosby. Matches ignite and fuse to my hand. I've been placing packs next to loose cigarettes to help get ready for the big surprise gal. I'm a distraction for mother who tells me, go into town for burn appointment with Bill. Bill and I set out in the ambassador's limousine, unaware dad wants it for Big Crosby's arrival, where the American singing star will be swarmed at the airport by fans and reporters. The chemist is closed. Bill knows of another. He drives around Dublin until we conclude all chemists must close on Saturdays at noon. Dad is fuming when we get home. He thinks we've been joyriding. Well, he met Mr. Crosby in the, well, I'm going to say crappy station wagon. I'm a model of contrition at dinner, eventually able to sneak away to the ballroom, filled with musicians and female dancers in kilts, their ribbons scolding back mounds of hair. Returning to the dining room, I see Mr. Crosby coming out of the men's room. Where'd you run off to? I made one mistake with him already today and cannot ruin his big surprise. I was upstairs watching The Untouchables on TV. Dinner ends, doors open wide, musicians play, and everyone is happy about the big surprise gala. Next day I go with Mr. Crosby and Dad in the good car, where they'll play money, or they'll play golf to raise money. 
the society for the prevention of cruelty to children. On the way there, with a box of golf balls in hand, Mr. Crosby cracks me hard on the head. Untouchables, he says. He knew I had lied. This is called Slap. And um, it describes the opening of my life. It is such a joyful poem. And it's where the healing began from shame and stigma and broken relationships. Ten years of silence because no one in my family could talk about my father. No one could talk about suicide. And that's why I'm here tonight because I want to open up the conversation because it is a painful discussion. But for some it has to be had and, and I, I want to be a part of that discussion. Slab. I'm 11. On my head is a two foot thick slab like a steel vault door that stretches to infinity in every direction. I know I will kill myself. Everyone said I was just like my father, which made me proud. I'm just like my father. So I am predestined, a fact, like the sun or the moon. I won't commit suicide until I'm 47 like my father. My big sister counseled me to drop out of college and get into therapy. I'm about 22 and one day, walking down a sidewalk near DuPont Circle in DC, I see the sky plainly. The slab is gone. Within months after experiencing the slab gone from my life, I moved from D.C. to New York, where I hoped to be the new Bob Dylan. <laughs> this is called Are You Jackie Kennedy? I pick up my cab near the west side docks, shoot into Midtown by my regular route. When three men flag me down for 70th and Park, I drop them off, and on the opposite corner, a woman I recognize raises her hand. She gives me an address on Central Park West. I know who it is, but I ask, are you Jackie Kennedy? Yes, she says. Do you know who I am? No, I'm Grant Stockdale's son. How weird, she says, and leaning forward. You look just like your father. Your voice, I tell her, is so soft. It's hard to hear you through this bulletproof glass. Yes, she says pointing to the round holes we must fall through. They even look like bullet holes. I'm suddenly embarrassed to be driving a cab, the son of President Kennedy's ambassador, to Ireland. I don't tell her I live next door to the Hells Angels and chase rock and roll poetry up East Village fire escapes. I'm taking time off from college. I don't really know what I want to be, maybe a psychiatrist or an Episcopal priest. Yeah. Oh, John and Caroline don't know what they want to do either. And just like that, she makes me feel like one of her kids. It's like chatter now, the city, February cold. She comes around, pings the fair at my window. If there's anything I can do for you, just let me know. She begins walking away, then turns back to give me the famous Jackie Kennedy smile. Well, it's hard not to overstate uh, the, the importance that I had in my life. Um, it resurrected all the good feelings that I, that I did not feel uh, about the Kennedys and my father. And she was so sweet and so dear and so authentic, like a member of the family, that in fact I thought, you know, maybe I don't have to be the new Bob Dylan. Maybe I have to be the new Lee Stockdale. And, and that was uh, really a turning point. <clears throat> this is the uh, title poem, Gorilla, uh, from the book. I scale the Empire State Building to rescue the girl who will become my wife but doesn't know it. She ignores that I'm a hairy gorilla with pet.
depths as big as the Yankee infield. Because I'm famished from scaling the building, I'm afraid I will eat a coal like an anchovy, since I don't bring silverware when I scale. It's all I can do to grab onto the gargoyles and swing. Sometimes I stick my big eye in an office window, but I don't eat her. Instead, she and I walk to Central Park, where we sit on a bench and I carve gorilla plus future wife in a heart. She says that if it wasn't for Robert F. Kennedy in New York, they'd still be treating the mentally ill like animals, padlocked in cells with no air and no light, kept barely alive with food shoved through slots <clears throat> in the door by uniformed guards, never or rarely allowed to see family. I'm going to learn so much from her. So I did things that were incredible to me. I went back to college, I joined the army, I enlisted, I went to Officer Cannon School as my father had enlisted in the Marines and went to Officer Cannon School. I think he started law school but had to drop out because he had two little babies and, and couldn't, couldn't do it financially. I went to law school and spent 30 years in the army and uh, retired and we went to settle in Tryon, where the last of our the last three of our five children, two of them are here this evening, um, graduated from Pope County High School. While I continued to practice law in Rutherford, Polk, and Henderson counties, giving rise to the following two poems: <clears throat> Understanding, my client up for armed robbery, dispenses facts like gifts. I'm his public defender and hold my laptop up to the glass of the jail's claustrophobic interview room. To play him the video the DA just gave me, he watches intently. He's searching his mind, then decides forcefully, that's not me. I've been photoshopped in. Those aren't my hands. He holds up his hands. What about your face and head looking around? <laughs> they got it from Facebook, the internet. I don't know. Anywhere. He tells me to inter interrogate everybody who handled the video. He'll find out who it was they look like me. I remind him of his almost identical charge, the bodega robbery two years ago. He's still on parole, the reason they always deny it. I made a mistake, but that's not me this time. I gather his file and rise to leave. When he looks up, I'll plead guilty. Get me the best deal you can. <laughs> <laughs> Criminal justice. Lawyers strip money from clients in vestibules. The DA wheels by with an evidence frame, crammed with running shoes, kitchen knife, leather purse, pearl choker. Jurors rehearse guilty, not guilty, as the court reporter grains hands on her tiny machine. Witnesses remember, disremember, can't recall, reach for Kleenex as sports talk radio leaks from an earpiece of a bailiff stuffing prisoners into the timeout box. And separate stale clouds of last night's breath hang above pews. Packed with girlfriends, boyfriends, wives, ex-wives, baby mamas who try to catch eyes of their luckless downcast. Hear ye, hear ye. The judge leaps the rail, flees the courthouse with inmates following, bailiffs, guards, girlfriends, Everyone runs now, ducking up side streets, jumping down manholes, dashing to escape from criminal justice. <laughs> this is called unforeseen consequences of cremation. It was interesting. Somebody pre-ordered the book and I was happy that they read it and had a comment about this this poem, they said, 
uh, wrote me and said, I'm really sorry. I mean, I'm really happy, happy that you, uh, that you feel as strongly against cremation as I do. <laughs> and I thought, well, I didn't know it was an anti-cremation poem, but if that's what this person found in it, well, that's all right. Unforeseen consequences of cremation. I am floating at the top of Bob Johnson's evening martini. A flake of me settles on splintered wood bleachers of the Polk County Little League baseball field. Some of me gets run over by the left rear tire of a Winnebago heading for the Cherokee National Forest. When I told my family I wanted to be cremated, my ashes poured into the Chocolate River, where my father taught me to fish, where I taught my three boys to fish. It never occurred to me my ashes might end up on the left rear tire of a Winnebago, as nothing guarantees your wind-borne particles won't be inhaled by a dog in the park, or get caught in the hair of sunbathers as they talk in a roundabout way of marriage. He says he wants them. She says she does not. Cause it for the first time. A, a fundamental difference between them. So that later, at Tryon's Side Street Pizza, stealing glances at each other over pepperoni, they must secretly wonder if their love is strong enough to bridge the chasm opening between them like the Grand Canyon. To which part of me travels, even now, on the left rear tire of the Winnebago. <laughs> the donkey speaks. I have a very good friend who read this, and she was not pleased at how I treated this donkey, but I think this donkey gets, gets a story wrong. The donkey speaks. How do I get picked for these tasks? I can barely keep my eyes on the road with all these joyful fools crowding in. Hosannas and hallelujahs stab sheaves of wheat in my ears. No one should wonder why I slide them back. This fellow I carry, it's like he's a king, a one-man circus, big celebration. Where's the party? Nobody briefed me. Information zero. They're laying palm fronds in my back, and now, literally, the shirt's off their backs. Later, at the donkey bar, there's an actually going to talk about all the hoopla. Aren't you the lucky one? I got extra hay. Now I'm a celebrity, the star of the barn, telling them how great it was with all the palm fronds and hallelujahs. A few days later, we hear the news. Wasn't that him who rode in on your back? No, I say, I never knew. <laughs> George Washington, that Walmart. <laughs> of course it's George Washington. In the dairy section of the Super Walmart on Highway 61. He looks out of place in his white stockings, bridges over his knees, and powdered wig, unless that's his real hair. Out of place, yet at the same time at home, like he owns this Walmart and everything in it. Plastic lawn chairs from China, dish towels, chainsaws, owns the entire United States of America, Statue of Liberty, Redwood Forests, every song ever written by Woody Guthrie. He looks puzzled by choices, non-fat, 2% whole, enriched. I want so much to help him decide want to shoot him a dairy farm, electric pump, hooked up to cows, want to Google America on Wikipedia for him, watch him be dumbfounded by the country he fathered. It's a, it's a well-written, unobserved rule. No one talks to each other when they shop at a Walmart. <laughs> Dante's Ibex. <coughs> this morning I looked in the mirror to discover I have significant eyebags that snuck in over the years and gradually set up shop until they are now mature and grand enough to announce, Hello, we're here, we're your eyebags. I want to hate them. Except they make me look like Dante Facel. 
the congressman from Miami who beat my father in the Democratic primary in 1954 and held that seat for 40 years. In 1990, at a Homestead, Florida, Fourth of July parade, Dante and I sat together in the VIP bleachers. He as a congressman, I as Homestead's National Guard commander. I introduced myself as my father's son, and Dante apologetically tried to explain the confusing politics that induced him at the last minute to enter the race and beat my father, who, before Dante jumped in, ran unopposed. I stopped listening. More interested in Dante's deeply jowled face, the eyebrows that drooped like ripple sacks of flour from his lower eyelids onto his cheeks. So this morning, no, I do not hate my eye bags. They make me feel like I could beat my father in a Democratic primary for congressman from Miami. <laughs> I'm going to read two poems, uh, not in Gorilla, um, but they're from my new manuscript. And um, a lighter manuscript, I like to call it. This is called Thank you, Melissa, with three exclamation points. I canceled home delivery of the Sunday Times with online chatbot, Melissa, who was sorry and wrote in the chat box, why are you canceling? I typed, too much to read. Melissa, do you know you can pause delivery? Me, not interested. Please cancel subscription. Melissa. You can also suspend. Me, what's the difference between pause and suspend? <laughs> Melissa, a suspend is longer. Me, what if I combine pause with suspend? <laughs> Melissa, L-O-L, -L, you have to pick one or the other. I suspected by Melissa's L-O-L, -L, she was a live human being. Me. I pick pause, pause me forever. <laughs> Melissa then explained, with a monthly upgrade, I could get podcasts, background interviews, exclusive behind the scenes stories I was not now getting with just the Sunday Times. And with the upgrade, I get Sunday home delivery free! <laughs> exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Those three exclamation points were so spontaneous. There was no way Melissa was a non-human child. What was likely a single mother with a baby to feed, possibly a restraining order against an ex, a large dog to walk in difficult weather. And here she was offering me this excellent deal. <laughs> I didn't have to think, okay, sign me up. I already felt more in the know with behind the scenes stories and exclusive interviews. Thank you, Melissa, for brightening my day, for boosting my confidence in mankind and journalism. I, an average man who only minutes before was about to cancel home delivery. <laughs> It's so great to be smart, isn't it? Just great. And I'm reading this uh, because I like it. You know, sometimes you just have to read a poem that you yourself like. And I, I happen to like this poem. I also like Chagall, the, the poet, I mean, the, uh, the painter. So this is called I Am and Am Not Chagall. I became my own Chagall. Angels flew over houses. A coat of blue trumpets of solid gold. The sky was blue, deep blue, blue, the, that fell from white clouds filled with yellow stars. A man with a black beard pushed a wheelbarrow. Inside the wheelbarrow was a singing pig. The man said the singing pig was mine and had been mine since the beginning of time. <laughs> Why did I have to be Chicago for this? I can 
be me and still have a pig. The roads led off in many directions, deeply rutted, winding over blue hills. Since the sky that fell also covered the earth, though with a blue distinct from the streams, the streams from the rivers, the rivers from the seas, and none of the buildings were pockmarked by shell shock. They must have negotiated a lasting peace. But because of my memories, I knew of the danger and began painting angels as fast as I could. <coughs> and uh, this is the last poem of the book and of the evening. I hope everybody has something from the Bible that they love. And mine is the 23rd Psalm. This is the 23rd Psalm, the 23rd Psalm annotated. The Lord is my shepherd, though I'm not a sheep. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restoreth my soul, even if it's in the rivers, and leads me beside still waters. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. And I've been down paths not paved with righteousness. So I look forward to finding where the new paths go. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, and were with me when assassination and suicide rock my life. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me, so if I were a sheep, thou make sure I don't stray and get roasted by bandits. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, perhaps the same bandits thou just outwitted. Thou anointest my head with oil, and I'm confident thou knowest how much I can take. My cup runneth over, so things can get messy. The reason I keep this song by my side, knowing surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Thank you so much for coming, and now if anyone has any questions, Now, the first question is, did he ever talk about it? Now, how do you mean, don't talk about it? Did he talk about it? Did he say I'm depressed? Oh, he was terribly depressed. Oh my gosh, I was there. I mean, I was, I was 10, 11, so he was terribly depressed. I remember him walking down the hall of his bedroom saying, I don't know, 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 five times. Yes? Meaning depressed post the death of Right. Okay, not yes. in general. Yes. No, no, he wasn't a depressed man. Okay, all right. And in fact, he went up twice to the Kennedys, uh, to Washington, and um, he met with Robert and Teddy privately, and and Teddy actually called my mother and said he, he he's really terribly depressed. He's terribly depressed. I mean, and this is coming from from Jack's brothers who were depressed. You know, I mean, everyone uh, was depressed and, and, and grieving. Um, but, and, and what could be done? I think, yeah, I mean, I don't know if, if what, what could have been done in that span of 10 days, but I think that uh, it took me 10 years before my big sister suggested to me that I drop out of college and get into therapy. And I was, I was with this fabulous guy who I could just talk with. And I talked to him and said things that just came out naturally. Uh, I'm angry at my father. I love my father. Um, I'm sad. The things that I could not. And so these are just sort of pedestrian, run-of-the-mill sorts of emotions that one would think one might have after the experience of a loved one committing suicide. But when one is not allowed to talk about it because of the stigma because of the taboo, because of the shame, then, you know, one is blocked off. I was. And, um, you know, I mean, and I don't, I don't blame anything. I don't blame anyone but myself, you know. 
for those for not being able to be a better teenager. You know, I mean, who has a good teenage year? I mean, you know, we all have difficult times. Uh, but I think that it's it's so wonderful now uh, to have suicide prevention month, to have walks. I've been on a suicide walk with friends, um, other friends whose, whose loved ones have committed suicide. Uh, it's healing, and it's just it's just a question of talking through. You know, it's just a question of talking through these things and uh, and being being allowed to talk. You know, and I, I will tell you when I when I reach out to people about reading from this book, they're not all like Jen Wade. They're not all like Pat Memorial Library. Um, some are very uh, very very open, and, but but some they don't want to talk about this either. It's a difficult subject. And frankly, I'm trying to make it as palatable as possible. I really am. And you know what? I mean, it's this uh, this picture, in fact, you know, it's a great picture of my father with Jack Kennedy. Um, but my hope kind of is that it's so sort of disconnected, you know, disconnected from someone's normal reality that they, they, can, they can get into this and that it makes it even it kind of accessible, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, it's kind of accessible that, oh, what's that? And so that they can learn something from this because I really do have, you know, I really have, I really have a burden for this malady pandemic, if, if you will. And uh, my veterans friends are back there. Um, you know, the veterans are taking their lives and it just kills them. But I mean, it just hurts my heart, uh, and I and I want to be able to do something. You know, you, one wants to take care of one's soldiers. That was the thing about being an officer in the army. You take care of your soldiers. And I think, gosh, what can I do? So this is what I'm doing, and I, I'm hopeful. And in fact, uh, I can work more closely with the veterans. And, you know, spread this news. Yes. Do you think that uh, the not being able to talk about it was that part of what was that slab that was on your head? And can you say more about what precipitated that moment when the sky turned blue? You know, I'm so glad that you brought that up. I'm so glad you asked that. I literally thought and felt this physical thing on my head. And in fact, I've only recently, so I'm going back to my 50th high school reunion uh, this month, and I've looked at some old photographs of me in the ninth grade, and I am shorter than all the other kids. And I really believe it was something about. It. But um, so here's the funny thing, or not really not funny, but the interesting thing, and I'm so glad you asked that question because I didn't even know that I had this sort of subconscious did not desire. Uh, it was like a fait accompli. It was like an absolute, well, I know I'm gonna kill myself. That was, and so that, that really colored a lot of decisions as a, as a teenager. You know, I won't go into the litany of bad decisions that were just destructive and ridiculous. Uh, but, um, and yes, I think that just, you know, sort of, you know, eating away at that, that, that festering idea of I'm gonna have to kill myself and the, and the physical manifestation of that emotional, intellectual idea is this, this metaphoric slab uh, I think it was just talking through it. It was so funny. I was uh, I was with a guy named Max Boverman, who was somewhat famous in D.C. for being very a psychiatrist, being very confrontive. And I I was 22, and all of a sudden I'm in group therapy with all these ancient old women. I mean, like they were 30, and they were talking about they were talking about like. But, 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 the, but they felt like they had, they were so free. And I thought, oh gosh, they're talking about their absurd problems. I don't even know. You know, I mean, they, they have all kinds of issues that a 22-year-old male does not have. And, uh, but it enabled me, it gave me permission. I mean, I felt a, uh, a milieu of allowance to just be, to be honest, you know, and to, and to be, and to say things that, like, to get angry at my father, you know, sort of get angry at the floor and pretending that I'm 
but, uh, but and to love him, you know? And I really loved this guy, this psychiatrist, elegant man, a great, wonderful psychiatrist, well-dressed, successful. So I transferred a lot of, you know, like, oh, I like you, I can, you know, I love this guy, you know? And, uh, and so it was terrific. But yeah, that, and the slab just one day, it was just unbelievable. And it was, I have to say, it was a simultaneous recognition. There was the simultaneous recognition, and I remember where I was walking, kind of away from DuPont Circle, sunny day, the simultaneous recognition was, oh my God, the slab is this thought that I have to kill myself. And it was, it was almost like a, an absolute dovetail experience. I don't have to do that. It was a recognition and a dismissal. I didn't know that I had that thought until I had it. And then realized in, with my intellectual 22 year old mind, well, that is crazy. That is nuts. You don't have to do that. And uh, it wasn't shortly thereafter that I quit therapy. Oh, God, he was very upset. <laughs> I don't want to tell you the things he said. He was very honest. He, um, I won't tell you the things he said. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been really healing. Yes, sir. Lee, you're, um, like, you, you bore the brunt of this, but how does it pass to your kids? How, or does it, did you try to keep, or do they feel this weight of their grandfather's loss? Do you know, it's so funny that you should ask that. I invited my son, Ben, to, uh, to look through all of my father's, I mean, all of my father's archives of, of mementos, I mean, you know, his inaugural badge and his invitation to Jack and Jackie's wedding, all these kinds of photographs, letters, articles, all these kinds of things. And Ben absolutely stepped into it and said, oh, I'll do that. I'll, I'll put all that together. And he did, and it's, it's on the website. Uh, that one, and so, I mean, I've absolutely invited them into, you know, everything I can, I can provide in terms of, uh, you know, my experience and my, my own trauma and my own healing from it. So, uh, and, and, I, and I'm so grateful for my sons and, and my, two, my two daughters, three sons and two daughters and four grandchildren and one of them. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Lee. Um, just thinking about other people who were living underneath that slab, and was there a moment, you know, when, were you doing some spiritual work? Did you have some influence by some other person that somehow spurred you to realize that you could let, you know, when you're having a conversation with God, you know, what can we do for those people who are currently weighted down with this thought, I mean, I look at people, and you can tell sometimes, whoa, they are, they are, they are weighted down with, with gosh knows what. And how can we reach those people as a community? I mean, looking at Polk County with all of its sunflowers downtown Columbus, of all those suicides that have been Polk County, our little county, you know, and realizing that we've got to do something. And I know it's everywhere. To answer your question, I was so absolutely in the palm of God's hand. My sister Sally uh, went to Grace Church in Georgetown. Joe Tart was the, was the rector. <clears throat> he and Nancy, and I'm still in touch with Nancy, he and Nancy uh, were great friends of my older sisters and her husbands. Um, and they were so uh, loving to me and supportive. Um, I cannot be more grateful for the church. Um, and that's my personal experience. I mean, there are, there are all kinds of fellowship opportunities, spiritual fellowship opportunities, whether it's Judaism or Islam or Christianity or Zen or, or you name it, you know. But I think that so, it's so important that one finds fellowship of some sort. So just being available. Just being available for people and, and sharing their own stories of light. I think sharing their own stories. I'm going to share with you a story, and I, I hope I don't bore you, but it was 
I went to Queen's University for my MFA, and we had an open mic night, and a woman got up and told this story. Um, actually, she read the story. Her husband had been an Air Force pilot, and he committed suicide. And she took all of his pictures off the walls, didn't want to hear anything about it. And she had three little girls, three little girls, and they would disappear. And, you know, she didn't think much about I mean, disappear in the house. They, she did, they, they, dis, they would disappear. Well, and this, this went on, you know, she let them play, she let them play. She found out that they were having memory nights, memory times. Memory times to remember their father. And I'm not doing a very good job, but it was, uh, it was, it was heartbreaking. But when she found out that they were, I think they were like meeting under the stairs, you know, in one of those closets, flashlight photographs. I mean, it was heartbreaking. But um, she was reaching out. This woman was reaching out. That was a painful story. She put all the pictures back on. She said, I'm going to start meeting with you. I'm going to start meeting with you. We're all going to meet and have that remembrance story. Um, so that was a story that, that resonated with me. And, 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 and I think with other people I know, with other, others as well. And um, I can only hope that, that my, my story, her story was healing, because frankly it was so painful. And, but, it was, but it was so authentic and so real. And, uh, and so I just, I just hope that, uh, you know, in some way I can be a part of discussion, you know, a part of the, that, discuss, that healing discussion. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, Lee, um, having read your book and, and having known you a little bit, um, I could really see how what you wrote was very good and uh, very meaningful. And I, I, I just keep people ask me about what you're doing. And I think that, first of all, I think fellowship is very important. Love is very, very important. But I think taking the time to put it to paper, pen, is very, very important. I know. When my wife passed away, I went to a grief counselor, and uh, she just said, write down something that was monumental in memory, and I did. I can't believe that one of those episodes I wrote lifted so much of the pain from me. <laughs> so I, I, I think just encouraging people, even by themselves, just to journal and uh, regular basis, I think it's very, very helpful. Well, I think there's no better note on which to end the evening, and I thank you so much for coming. <laughs>